Good day friends. My name is Peter de Villiers and I come to you from Villiersdorp Community Church in South Africa. Today we're back with Jesus' parables after a break of six weeks. Now during the six week period I had a break and then we had messages leading toward Easter and then we had Easter with the wonderful reminders of God's love for us in sending his son to die on the cross. Last week we had Trevor Becker. Now Trevor will be preaching for us more or less once a month and he'll be going through the book of Acts when he preaches. But if you're new here, all the normal links are in the description below. And amongst them you'll find information on, on our banking details. And if you're blessed by this message, please consider making a financial contribution toward our ministry at Filiersdorp Community Church. Before we do anything else, let me pray. Father God, we come to you today with praise. We praise you for your love and your grace. And we praise you for giving us life and for your daily care. And when praising you for this, we pray that we will grow in our knowledge and understanding of the extent of your love and grace and of the extent of your care for us. Please use your word today to help us grow in this way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're back with Jesus' parables. Now, just to remind you where we are, when we started with Jesus' parables, I mentioned that we can separate the parables into five categories. Namely, here they are again. Parables of the kingdom, parables of salvation, parables of wisdom and folly, parables of the Christian life, and parables of judgment. Today we start with the last of these categories, namely the parables of judgment. Let me start by reading Matthew 18 from verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Now, have you ever had the experience of being really humiliated? I mean, that feeling you get that you just want to find a hole through the floorboard so that you could hide under them. For example, you're at a very posh social event. Everyone is making light conversation while, while eating fine dining tidbits of food. And there's a buzz in the room interrupted every now and again by even louder laughter. Suddenly your whole plate is overturned. All 
over the guest of honor who, who just happened to walk past you at that moment. And there's a sudden silence and all the eyes in the room are on you. You stand there not knowing what to do. But very graciously, the guest of honor says to you, don't worry, my people will sort this out. Do you feel humiliated? Do you feel small? You know, in Afrikaans, there's a very descriptive expression for this. It goes like this. Jy maak jou naam krater. So literally translated, that would be, you, you make your name to be a crater. Perhaps I could use the expression in English, you, you hit, your na hit your name with a plank. I mean, this type of smelling, feeling small has a lot to do with one's ego. Let me use another example. For example, you're busy gossiping about someone and really enjoying it when that person walks into the room. And you know he's heard what you've just said about him. You wish you hadn't said what you've just said. To make things even worse, this man had been a very good friend to you in the past. Then this friend who, who could use this situation to really get back at you and humiliate you even further, he says, don't worry, it's okay. I won't let this impact negatively on our friendship. You know that's the last thing you deserve, but, but this friend forgives you. You know, feeling small or being small this is a major theme, not only in the verses we read, but in the whole chapter of Matthew 18. Now, normally, being small is humiliating. It's a sign of weakness. But Matthew 18 goes further. Being small is something that we are instructed to be. We have to be small. We have to be humble. In Matthew 18, verse 2 to 4, Jesus says that, that if we do not become small, we cannot see the kingdom of God. If we do not become like little children, we will not be able to enter the kingdom of God. See, being childlike then determines access to God's kingdom. Verse 3 says, And he, that is Jesus, said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom. Of heaven. Now let's see how this plays out in the verses we read, starting with uh, Peter's question. So we have Peter coming to Jesus with this question. Now by this time, I mean, we've come to know Peter as this quick speaking, quick acting disciple. But perhaps we should commend him this time, that, that he's bold enough to ask Jesus this question. And let's assume that he's asking this as someone who's who's teachable and really wanting to learn from Jesus. But Peter's question had a background. The, this question did, didn't just fall out of thin air, because this was a question that had been debated by rabbis over the years. And Peter was probably bringing this question or this debate to Jesus for clarity. Now, in one of the Jewish documents from the year 180, a rabbi, Jose ben Judah, is quoted as follows. He said, if a brother sins against you once, forgive him. A second time, forgive him. A third time, forgive him. But a fourth time, do not forgive him. Now, perhaps Peter had assumed that Jesus would take forgiveness a step further than the rabbis had. So he asked, but Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? In other words, not just three times, he goes further. But of course, Peter had underestimated Jesus and Jesus answers him. In verse 22, we read, Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, some translations don't have 70 times 7, but 77. I believe that the, the context indicates the larger number. In other words, 70 times 7. This to me is more accurate in that I believe that Jesus is contrasting a very large number 
with a very small one. And then Jesus illustrates this answer with a parable. Jesus tells the story of a king doing an audit of his books. One of the servants owes him 10,000 bags of gold, a massive debt. So let's call him debtor one. Debtor one is called in, and of course he can't pay this debt. So the king orders that debtor one, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, be sold to repay the debt. The debtor one falls down on his knees and he pleads with the king for patience, promising that he will pay all the debt. Now, of course, the likelihood of this with him being a servant isn't good. So the king has pity on him and does so much more than this man asked for. The king cancels debtor's one, debtor one's debt and he's free to go. But as debtor one leaves, he runs into someone that owes him only a hundred silver coins, tiny, compared to the 10,000 bags of gold. Let's call him debtor two. So debtor one grabs debtor two and demands repayment. And exactly as debtor one had done before the king, debtor two now goes on his knees and he pleads for patience, promising to repay the debt. But debtor one has debtor two thrown into prison until his debt is paid. And of course the king comes to hear about this. And, and he, debtor one is called in again and is brought before the king. We read in verse 32, You wicked servant, he said, <clears throat> I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Now that's where the parable ends. But Jesus then applies this parable in just one verse. And, and this, six, this single verse is where it gets complicated. Verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister, from your heart. Now at face value, it seems as if Jesus' application is saying that if we forgive others, God will forgive us. In other words, we have here a works religion. I earn God's forgiveness if I forgive others. Now I would hope that all of you would, would ask here, yeah, but hang on, Aren't we forgiven of our sin and saved by God's grace through faith? So if this works religion interpretation isn't what Jesus' application teaches, then maybe Jesus is saying that we are saved by grace through faith, but you can lose your salvation. God may withdraw his forgiveness if you don't forgive others. Well, this also flies in the face of everything we know about the gospel of salvation as, as we've come to know it in the rest of the Bible. So how do we understand Jesus' application? Well, some commentators have tried to solve this dilemma by saying that Jesus didn't really mean what he said. They view Jesus' application as an exaggeration of the truth to emphasize the importance importance of us forgiving others. But knowing Jesus, this can't be true. I mean, Jesus never said anything without meaning what he said. So other commentators have said that, that Jesus' application was only applicable to Jews living under the law. In other words, um, it was only applicable to the time before Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. They are saying that this parable and Jesus' application has nothing to do with us. I mean, we are forgiven of our sin and we are justified and saved by God's grace through faith. We are forgiven. And it doesn't matter whether we forgive others or not. Well, again, this interpretation can't be correct. You see, Jesus didn't come with the old covenant law. He came and he preached the gospel message of salvation in Christ. 
So what then is Jesus saying? So we have to take what Jesus is saying seriously. But take it seriously without losing sight of the rest of the gospel message. So Jesus is certainly not saying that God only forgives us if we forgive others. And Jesus is certainly not saying that we can lose our forgiveness if we don't forgive others. No, God forgives us because Jesus stood in for us, taking our well-deserved punishment for our sin. This forgiveness is offered to us by grace through faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 says this very clearly. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Yet, Jesus is certainly saying that there is some or other definite link between God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of other people. So what is that link? Now, I believe Jesus is trying to wake us up to the fact of the life-changing character of the gospel. You see, being confronted with our sin and being confronted with the price that Jesus paid on the cross for our sin and being confronted with the promise of everlasting life with God in the new heaven and the new earth despite our sin. And being confronted with the enormity of God's love and grace. And being confronted with the truth of the gospel message. These are all things that, when accepted through faith, cannot but change your life. You see, there are two events that take place when a person comes to faith in Jesus as Savior. The one is that that person is, being just, is justified. That person is declared just, forgiven, saved. And this happens the moment that we humble ourselves, the moment we realize our indebtedness to God, the moment we realize that we deserve God's judgment, the moment that we are made small with the knowledge that we cannot save ourselves, the moment we realize that, that we are totally dependent on Jesus' acts of salvation. At that moment, God grants the forgiveness for our sin. But that's not all. From that moment on, we have what we call the process of sanctification. See, as we grow in knowing God, in knowing His love and His grace, and as we grow in knowing how enormous God's grace is, and as we grow in faith in Jesus, then miraculously, over time and unavoidably, there is a change that takes place. Your life can never be the same. Never again can you live only for yourself. Because you were bought by the blood of Christ. Saved from having to face God as judge. But saved into a life lived for God. Saved by being forgiven your enormous debt of sin against God. And saved into a life of forgiving others their, their always smaller debt of sin against you. That is what Jesus is illustrating with this parable. Now let me conclude by mentioning three points that this parable um, gives us. First of all, the parable teaches us that there is a judgment coming. All of us have an enormous debt toward God because of our sin against Him. And just like the king opened his books to settle accounts, there will be a day of reckoning when God will call everyone to account. And this judgment hangs over every person who has not humbled himself or herself confessing this debt before God, pleading for forgiveness. And that's the second point um, from the parable. There is forgiveness. And this forgiveness is offered freely by God, and it is based on Jesus' substitutionary death for us. And then thirdly, 
the proof of having been convicted of the enormity of our sin and rebellion against God. And the proof of having realized the need for the enormous price that Jesus paid on our behalf on the cross. And the proof of having received by grace, through faith, the forgiveness from God is a life lived for God. Referring to this, many theologians have been quoted as saying, we are justified by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. Now these words are a perfect summary of what the book of James teaches us. Let me read three verses from James. James 2 verse 17 to 19 says, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, but you have faith, I have deeds. So show me your faith with our deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. When it comes to forgiveness, let us not pretend that it's easy to forgive. You see, it is in our nature to to want to drive home the point that we've been wronged and, and we do this by having the perpetrator shown as far and wide as possible as a terrible person. In the parable, that is illustrated by debtor one refusing to forgive debtor two. But let us not forget that forgiving others is proof of realizing the enormity of our greater debt that has been forgiven by God. And this does not mean that every time I struggle to forgive someone, I'm proving that I'm not forgiven by God. See, the challenge is that every time I struggle to forgive, I have to remember that God has forgiven me. I have to remember that Jesus gave his life for for this forgiveness. That, that because of this, I have an eternal future with God. How can I then not forgive? See, standing before God very regularly with this knowledge, with this realization of our sin and His grace, this should humble us, make us small every time we come to God in prayer. And it should so humble us that we will grow in a willingness to forgive others. Let me pray. Father God, we come to you again with our massive debt of sin. We pray for your forgiveness. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your grace and your love. We pray that we will not forget the price that your Son, Jesus Christ, paid so that we can be forgiven by you. Help us to remember this every time we struggle to forgive. Help us to forgive, thereby showing your grace and your love toward others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was great to share again um, from God's Word with you. Today's song I want to suggest is the song King of Calvary by Matt Redman. There's a link to it in the description below and there's an on-screen link next to me. Next time, God willing, we'll be looking at another of Jesus' parables. Until then, God bless and goodbye.